Oh. Right, we are live. Hello and welcome everyone to Back From The Brink's live stream. Uh, this is one of a series of live streams that we're putting on. Uh, and just before we get started, uh, a little bit about Back From The Brink. Back From The Brink is a partnership programme all across England, uh, connecting up all the biggest conservation organisations to work on saving the most endangered species in England from extinction. But we're not here today to talk about Back From The Brink. Today, we're shining a spotlight on a young conservationist to hear directly from them about why young people should get involved with conservation. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to Arjun Dutta. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope, hope you can hear me nice and clearly. Uh, I hope you're well and looking forward to what looks, what looks to be warmer, brighter, more enjoyable summer than last. I know I really am. Firstly, I'd like to thank James and Jack from Back from Brink for hosting me today to talk about my love for wildlife conservation and why being involved in it is, as a young person is just so cool. So a little bit about me. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say that having re recently turned 18, I'm looking, looking to finish my A-levels in about a month's time and study geography at university afterwards. Uh, for my entire life, I've always been an outdoorsy person. Being outdoors just feels right for me, and I've always loved sports, especially cricket, which is how I normally spend most of my summer. The constant want to be out my, outside of my room and outdoors is what keeps me going and what sparked my love for nature in the first place. So at the moment, uh, as well as studying for A-levels, it's well, scary to think that in a month's time I'm finished together but in a month after that I'm going to going back to what I do what I do love and that's hopefully volunteering for the National Trust which I've been doing since I was 14 uh, and as well as this uh, working with the Camera Bespoke Trust and BTO uh, Youth Advisory Panel both of which I've been on for one and two years respectively. Uh, in 2019 and 2020, I worked with two other organisations uh, as you can see they were the I Will campaign which was a government-led social uh, a campaign for uh, the next generation of people and it involved social action and the London Wildlife Trust. All of these were incredible experiences and I will come back to talking about them later on. I think a lot of people often ask me what my spark was, which is a lot, a lot of young people find this when it comes into the environmental sector, what they've always loved to do. Uh, and I'd say my spark came from a big range of things. When I was seven, I think my mum got fed up with me liking football and dinosaurs and in her despair, uh, basically got me to the Big Garden Birdwatch, which is run every year at the end of January by the RSPB. Seeing, I think, a green woodpecker or something like that had me hooked. And ever since then, I but there's been no way back. Uh, when, when I was seven and eight, after, after getting involved, I decided to start a club at school, which was a, a birdwatching club. And it was widely promoted by my year five teacher. Uh, who was a huge role model to me for all those years back then. Even if I was, I know, see, claiming a snow bunting in the school playground, I think he was all the happier that I was getting involved with bird watching. But uh, going on from that, I think the two biggest spots into conservation specifically came uh, in two big trips for me. Uh, one of those was Indi going to India to visit family in 2012, but especially more than that is Malaysia, Malaysia in 2015. I think I've talked, I'll probably go on to talk about it a bit later on, but role models are such a crucial thing for me. And as you can see on the, on the screen uh, of the top right picture where I'm next to, well, my sister and uh, a man from that I met in Malaysia, Heidi was a massive role model to me. And I think there's no way I would have been like where I am now without him really setting me off and taking bird watching every day back then. I think when it comes to conservation specifically, seeing issues in Malaysia, for example, such as deforestation, seeing it firsthand really led me on to conservation specifically, because when I came back to the UK, it was one of those things of feeling like I'll have to do more because seeing wildlife affected directly really kind of puts you in the perspective of you want to make a difference. So after coming back, as I said, it was a few years of kind of being 12, 13, just not really know, knowing what I wanted to do in life, uh, but really just liking being outdoors and in uh, when I was 14, I decided to join the National Trust uh, because I, I spent most of my time there at the weekends anyway. I love bird watching there, I love photography there, and it was just more than that, just a safe place to be. 
Uh, the National Trust have done an amazing job there. Uh, before, it, when I was a lot younger and I used to visit, it was much, uh, much less safe to visit there. But by the time I was maybe 14, it was a lot safer. And that's all thanks to the National Trust. Uh, as I mentioned before, I had this kind of weird thing of like, I, I like to put like an environmental conscience. I think really, as you go older, you get older towards 14, 15, you start to realise the wider issues. And it's, I found it difficult to just visit uh, somewhere like Morden Hall, somewhere I almost treated like a second home. I found it difficult to visit and not want to actually help conserve it because it, it was hard to just enjoy all the wildlife without thinking, actually, I want to help protect it and make sure everything I'm seeing now can also be seen in 20 years time. Given it was 30 minutes by bus and a 15 minute drive away, it was fairly close to home, uh, which meant that I decided to get involved with volunteering there. Uh, my trigger for volunteering there was as well as all of this, Duke of Edinburgh, which I think is a fantastic way for young people aged 13 or 14 to find a love for conservation in nature. I'll come back to this later on towards the end of my presentation, but I think the Duke of Edinburgh is definitely a big thing in promoting conservation to young people. So after joining the National Trust, I was really taken away by the new community I've kind of come across. Uh, all the people that were there were just so friendly and willing to almost help me whatever I wanted to do. Within a week, I was visiting Brown Sea Island in Dorset, uh, seeing all sorts of nice birds and getting involved in red squirrel conservation, which having never been involved in anything before was quite an experience. As well as all this, it's not only is it a great community and it's a nice place to be, but you've always got some memorable m memories there that you've made that you always remember, no matter how stupid they are. For example, planting trees upside down on one of my first sessions was definitely one of those moments I'll never forget just for the sheer like awfulness of what I've just done, as well as that I've had so many good opportunities as well, and those ones will stick with me. For example, in 2019, that was probably my big breakout year for conservation when I got to talk at Country Bell Live on a panel with people such as Hilary McGrady, who's the Director General of the National Trust, Richard Walker, the Managing Director of Iceland, as well as other young people such as Bella Lack and Dara McNulty. Afterwards, when we met Theresa Villiers, at the time the news Environment Secretary. I think she's now been moved on uh, quite a while. But meeting all these people is one of those things that really opened my eyes to the opportunities available in the conservation sector. And I don't know, I, I don't know how any other way to put it, but I think meeting those people and going to opportunities like that are just so cool because you're getting opportunities that most young people wouldn't get. And now I feel like as a, as a result of all of these, the National Trust starting it off, I've grown a lot more confident when it comes to public speaking. I've always been naturally a writer my three uh, G, uh my three a levels of geography history and english which definitely not as much science in there as most people but at the same time i'm hoping to geography which is isn't exactly your most um well most non sciencey subject so i'm definitely getting more comfortable with things that most people my age might not be as comfortable with so moving on from that talking a little bit about social media so after joining uh, the Urban Rangers, I decided to get Twitter for the first time. I was, at first, I was pretty nervous and I didn't really know what to share. I, de I definitely wasn't sharing any pictures of myself just because I didn't really have any confidence in that at all. So I just started with wildlife, which was what I was most comfortable with. Uh, posting about the wildlife I'd seen locally and retweeting important issues really led me into the conservation and natural world and how it all works really. So a few months in, I started to realise how great the community really was. I'd never, I, I thought typically that I must be the only, if or one or two other young people in London interested in nature. Uh, but afterwards, I started to realise there were more than that and reached out to some of these people uh, to try and organise a young birds walk in London, which I did with one of my friends, Samuel Levy. On that first walk, we managed to get five people, which at the time we thought was a really good effort. Uh, and what was interesting about that is that all of the people there were very cool naturally. I just think some one of them's a semi-professional musician now, the others are really good at sport. You're not just there to see birds, but you're there to have a good laugh and meet new people that are actually very interesting. So after the first London Young Birders Walk in oh wrong side. Uh, after the first London Young Birders Walk, uh, which which we led, it was something that we all really, really enjoyed. And one of the last social birding things I did get to go to was at Rain and Marshes back in October with uh, two of my best mates, Sean and Sam. And it was one of those things that getting to see them again after everything that happened in the last year was really something that brought me back to it and remembering all the social opportunities that are available, which I would never have had 
without social media. So since then, we've had four further walks, and that was in 2018. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, we've been struggling to organise anything, but we're hoping we can get them going again soon. A few points about why we actually enjoy it, because I think at the end of the day, no matter how cool everything is when it comes to this, everyone wants to enjoy themselves, otherwise there's no point really doing them. I'd say five main points I'd make are firstly to do with mental health. I think all of us can find it very difficult and stressful uh, during the exam season and taking a break from work and other pressures to go and meet other people is just such a great thing to do and it's always really enjoyable. While also watching Amazing Wildlife, so some of the things we've seen there include white stork, willow emerald, damselflies, Mediterranean gulls, all sorts of brilliant birds. We've also been able to make friends with all who share common interests with us and actually at the same time we're looking forward going forward to organize more walks which can be in a more professional way where we might be able to get involved with conservation while we're there so a little bit off following twitter i think social media just to go on a little bit with that theme uh, as on the screen you can see there's i would say there's never been a better time to be a young person interested in nature that's probably arguable but if you look at all the opportunities available there's little doubt that and putting everything together there are so many things that young people can do so as well as young bird walks which is the first one that we had of the kind which was a young bird as walk led by young people for young people there are opportunities such as bird fair walks where young people get together balti uh, camp which is uh, on in an island off uh, off wales where young people can get the experience of ringing for example uh, and just as well as all this it's such a great community to get a part of now there's so many WhatsApp groups, as you can see on the right hand side, there's all bird watching WhatsApp groups I'm on at the moment, uh, where you can get involved and talk to new people. And if you don't know what a bird is, you can put it out there and ask others to help identify it. These are just some of the great things that you can get from the nature community or when you're involved in conservation. And that's why there's not just benefits to conservation environment, but, ben but benefits to young people as well. So two of the organisations I mentioned earlier on are the Cameron Bespoke Trust and the BTO. I'll talk a little bit about these but briefly uh, because I, uh, there's a lot of information online that if you do want to get involved with any of the conserva conservation within these, just please let me know afterwards and contact me on social media. Firstly, the Cameron Bespoke Trust I've been involved with since 2019. The trust background comes from a charity being set up in the memory of 16-year-old Cameron Spolka following his tragic death in 2013. Cameron had always had a strong love for nature and so his family really wanted to help young people have more opportunities available to them within the environment, the environmental sector. All the youth ambassadors, so there are 12 of us at the moment and we all work in a team alongside a board of trustees. We're really lucky to have Cameron's mother Corinne supporting and encouraging us because without her, the trust would not be able to run. What we follow at the trust is the motto that is a motto which is bringing children and nature together. One of the best things about this is that we all love nature in, diff in different ways and I think being able to share our interests which range from conservation and rewilding to gardening and environmental campaigning just by being able to work together and being supported by Corinne we're really lucky uh, because it means that we've got the platform to share our, our own knowledge and experiences and almost luck in a way with other young people. So our aim is to find new ways of engaging people from a wider audience with nature and conservation. At the moment, we're helping to sponsor some incredible events and opportunities. These include these young birders walks that I've just mentioned, as well as BTO bird camps, which are for young people between the age of 11 and 19, I believe, uh, as well as a once a year opportunity to visit Cornell in, 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 in America. All of these come alongside a new and upcoming project called Cameron's Cottage. Uh, Cameron's Cottage is, in collaboration with the RSPB, going to be a children's education centre in the New Forest, which will provide a base to inspire young people to experience nature in the South East. Um, it's one of those things that, while it's still in progress, we know that once it's completed, it's going to be amazing, and the impact it can have on people in that area will be just so, so great. Uh, for example, it's located somewhere where you've got lo lots of rare breeding birds, but the opportunities that you can do there include things such as ringing, which is a key, key part of conservation for birds and understanding what what comes around them. And just among all other, all other things as well, is going to be so great. Second thing is BTO. Uh, first BTO opportunity I had was in 2019 in the summer. 
where it was, I've probably had some of the best five days of my life. I'm not even joking there, it was amazing. I got, I was lucky enough to be invited to the Young Leaders Camp in Spurn and one of my favorite places. I can't wait to visit again this summer. What we were able to do was learn about professions and leadership in the conservation world, which really equipped us going forward as now I'm 18, I'm feeling a lot more confident uh, when I think about employment and things like that and just general leadership skills. I think I was nowhere near as comfortable in public speaking then and now I do feel less worried about it compared to before. So at the end of 2019, I hope after that uh, inspired them to get it going, I really think it did, uh, was to create the BTA Youth Advisory Panel for young people. Uh, essentially in 2020, there were 10 of us having regular meetings with five members of BTO staff who have been amazing since. And since then, we've developed four big aims to make bird watching and conservation seem more accessible and attractive for more young people. I think the cool barrier is, well, well word cool is always a barrier to people. And I think overcoming that, which I'll mention, we'll talk about a bit later on as well, is crucial. Four, the, so the four big aims we've come up with are the Youth Representative Scheme, uh, which is now uh, been completed and launched for almost six months, where uh, 15 young people across the UK are working on leading walks, delivering talks, are working with local groups to get involved and help more young people actively. That's one thing that's happened since. Another is the equipment and donation scheme, which is, I think, a fantastic way of providing uh, people possibly from uh, less privileged backgrounds with equipment that they might not otherwise, otherwise be able to afford. The two other things are training resources, which it can be delivered uh, through ringing equipment or books, which links to the EDS scheme, as well as online equipment for young people to learn, which will come in the sport schools and universities as well. I think what's amazing about the BTO, though, is the professional experiences we get. We've been given the opportunities to have short webinars and sessions and things such as the Art GIS or public speaking, which, as again, very few people my age would probably get, which means going, into, going towards uni, I'm feeling more confident talking to people in general. Progress wise, we've done very well and I'm definitely looking forward to going into the future as well. Something that I think is very important to speak is diversity uh, and when you're going into the conservation sector and really delving into who is involved with it, there's a real perception issue in the idea that conservation and bird watching and everything in the environmental sector is only for a certain group of people, which yeah, the perception is that it's, the, it's an old white male group, essentially, which is just to me completely wrong. And I think a lot of the young people will agree that the perception is that other young people think that's who it's for. When it, defining diversity specifically, I think it's, it's good to be clear exactly what it is. And I'd say it's the idea of including in, in, in the conservation sector anyone from any race, gender, socioeconomic background and age. I'd say currently it's quite clear there is a lack of diversity, but hopefully through things such as the EDS scheme and Cameron's Cottage, these are just two examples of addressing this issue and hopefully they will make it better in the future. While it's always been a personal issue to me, I've obviously someone from a South Asian background, I've always had a lot of amazing opportunities for it. I've rarely experienced anything such as racism and discrimination. However, I don't want to talk about that now. I think it's really good the opportunities I've had. And if anyone is interested in overcoming the ethnicity barriers there might be for people from different races, please get in contact afterwards or read my blog, which I've posted a picture of on the slides, where which I did last year. And I'm really glad people had such a positive response to it. Instead, I think when talking about diversity, somewhere I'd like to focus my attention on is how we can break down the core barriers so then anyone from any background can get involved with conservation and uh, nature. I'd say four points after the idea about perception that I've already mentioned, accessibility and safety is a big issue, especially for people uh, that might not otherwise feel safe at places by themselves. Um, it's been, it's been talked about widely recently after recent events have transpired and it can be quite shocking what you hear people have to do, especially women. Uh, talking about that will make conservation something more accessible uh, so then anyone can get involved with it because at the moment while I love it and know it's seriously cool others don't have such opportunities 
Another thing that can really help uh, overcome the diversity barrier are role models, as I mentioned. I've had various people from my mum to Steve Batchel watching on TV, to meeting Ivy back in uh, South Asia when I visited Malaysia, all the way to my school teacher in year five, who was the one who kind of pushed me back then to really keep going with bird watching. Role models are so cru crucial to keeping people interested. And uh, to me, I always go back to Steve Batchel. He made bird watching and conservation and getting involved with the environment so cool like picking up rare animals or just going to show what they really how amazing they are really all of that really pushed the idea that nature and conservation is cool and i think everyone my age that is interested in nature did watch deadly 60. we need more people like that moving on from this i think the power of sound is something that i always talk about i've always been someone who's not had as sharp eyesight as anyone else uh in in that way it means i've always relied a little bit on sound and i've always enjoyed listening to birds as much as seeing them after it after lockdown started i was persuaded to buy um uh by two friends that uh i should get involved with knockmig which is nocturnal migration uh, and where what we do is put out a recorder in the garden and at night different birds fly over. I think at, at the same time as it being just quite scientific and really interesting because you can really monitor the types of species flying over your garden at night. I've been amazed that my garden list, thanks to not me in South London alone, has passed over 100 species of bird, which is quite, quite astounding given where I live. I would never have expected it. While it can be slightly weird standing out in the cold uh, often to try and listen to a little soft sound as it goes over, such as a song thrush or a red wing. At the same time, you get you can get really you'll be really surprised as to what you can hear. For example, I'll, I'm going to play this sound and hopefully it will work now. Uh, something I recently heard from my South London garden while putting out my recorder. I hope everyone heard that and if anyone has a clue what it was well done but it was but it was a barn owl given where i live which is a very suburban the closest barn owl is just over a kilometer away uh, in some fields but between there and the field there's a whole load of houses and housing estates and very little green area so the fact that they're coming uh, along to where i am suggests that essentially they're feeding along the road because they're struggling to find food in the fields that just in itself is very exciting because you, and recently I was actually able to see the barn owl fly over in the uh, streetlights. Just something like that is one of those things that you never expect and that's where conservation just can be so cool because what I'm doing with all the sightings that I've got is contributing to citizen science. Uh, for example, uh, some of the websites I'm able to upload to with my records include Xenocanto, which is a big database online of all sorts of calls. Uh, Trek Tellen, which uh, counts migration counts. Recently, I had over a thousand red wings fly over in two and a half hours at night, which is one of those things that you'd never expect as well. So contributing to that is definitely helping with science and it's conservation in a less direct way than that I would have got involved with the National Trust, where I helped me biodiversity projects, which I've never been able to do before either. Uh, for example, one more scientific thing that I can show you is the map at the top right corner, which shows the geology of South London. As you can see, there's a big difference with the, uh, going towards the river, there's more uh, clay, uh, while further south there's chalk, which is higher ground. Often the birds seem to be following this chalk route, which means that there's a kind of link between uh, geography and geology with bird watching conservation, because some of the birds are following this chalk route rather than following the um, like water bodies. So, for example, some of the cool things I've learned about birds include uh, something like wimbrel, uh, which are coastal waders that uh, winter in Africa and breed in, in the Arctic or the subarctic. Then the most common bird wader I've, I've recorded on not maybe 13 times now, but uh, I think there must have been way fewer records in Surrey actually seen on the ground last year because most of the time they fly over at night and they're never actually seen. It's crazy to think that these little these birds are flying over yet I'm recording them and not many people are, which just shows how interesting it can be. Just going on from that, migration is one of those incredible things and con the, the contribution it has to conservation specifically is just, yeah, not is just awesome. For example, 
I recorded gold crests on not me as they flew over at night. Uh, they weigh the same as a 20p coin and able to cross the North Sea in a day, which just again shows how much you can learn from something like not me, while also it contributes to science. Sound more generally is one of those things that I've always loved and the benefits it, have, it has to me, as well as finding migration interesting, uh, it's also a less appreciated form of bird watching that really makes you kind of, it gives you a sense of mindfulness, being able to close your eyes and just listen to music and birds is something that stops me thinking and really cheers me up and brings a bit of peace to me. With, so alongside mental health, it's one of those things that I think if you didn't have the power of sound when it comes to the natural world, then you you would you really notice it. Just imagine you wake up in the morning and you, you couldn't hear anything except, you know, like, road traffic and all sorts of that no sounds of birds or animals would definitely be almost like an eerie silence but i like to think that the power of sound is one of those things that really keeps me going and as a result of this myself and a few friends have set up an account on twitter called ecos which means sound in greek uh, we hope through this to uh, grow the knowledge of bird sound uh, uh well extend the knowledge of bird sound across the community where people of all sorts can learn uh, at what they're hearing as well as what they're seeing, uh, which means that they can contribute to citizen science as well and help with conservation like this. Big shout out to uh, Joe, Pyram, Luke Mariner and Isaac West for setting that up as it was. it's so far been amazing and we've gained 2,000 followers in the, around the space of a month. So as I come towards the end of my presentation, I think it's almost to be clear why why care about conservation? Why should young people really get into it? Why does biodiversity crisis matter? What does nature get out of it? And what do we get out of it? Firstly, I'll just say the word cool. I think it's one of those words that could be really interpreted as one of the worst words out there. For young people, it probably that word gets more young people down about themselves than anything else. Where you look at others, someone who likes football, or everyone says, oh, he's so cool because he's slightly rebellious, or something like that it makes you kind of compare yourself to other people and I think the word cool itself can be a massive barrier because what is cool really to me it's cool to care about our, the natural world and the world we live in but at the same time other young people might not think that at the moment it's one of those things that links back to perception is it cool to be bird, a birder is it cool to like conservation at the moment not really but that's where young people that are interested in nature have to keep going forward and make continue to make it cool and show how cool it really is to like nature and that's where we need to prove people wrong so once again i'll link it back to the i will campaign which is something where i've offered me a lot of inspiration and in recent in the recent past young and one of the mottos they stand by is young people aren't just the leaders of tomorrow but they have the energy skills and ideas to improve society and our environment today i think if you want to link that to conservation specifically you can show the leaders that there are in the conservation sector, uh, all sorts of people such as Greta Thunberg, who have inspired so many people to act upon uh, the biodiversity and climate crisis we're in and get involved in conservation. I think it's clear that people often think that they might be able to change, to do, make a massive change themselves. And even if not everyone's going to be able to do something like Greta's done, being able to realise that you can do small anything, small things really do matter which is why conservation projects such as ringing or getting involved with curly conservation in moorlands or for example like one i did in Brancy island which was create habitats for red squirrels uh, a few years ago all of that is helping with conservation and it's one of those things that people can get involved it's not hard to look online and find the opportunities out there it's just hard to find the, almost the energy and strength to reach out and overcome the barrier that people may see you as less cool than anyone else. With the climate crisis, as I mentioned, continuing to be such a problem, so many species are continuing to struggle. Waxwings are one of my favourite birds, yet have declined year on year because it's too warm in the UK for them to winter here now. Trying to make sure that people realise how direct the climate crisis is on British wildlife and what birds and animals are being affected by it is one of those things that hopefully will continue to get more people pulled into the environmental sector. When it comes to human issues, I think that's a big reason to care about conservation. There are so many, so many things across the world that is a, a massive, uh, well, a massive really, 
Uh, rats persecution in the UK is, is a big one. Every year, every month almost, you hear about some sort of rats are being shot. And that's just one of those things that being able to have more young people continuing to know what's right and wrong, what's really, yeah, what's right and wrong when it comes to rats persecution, how moorlands should be managed. If more people are able to understand conservation is something to get into, and hopefully that won't be as much of an issue now as it will be in the future. Something like turtle doves being shot at as they migrate to and from Africa and the UK or Northern Europe every year is one of those things as well. Uh, one of the local birders to me suggested that, uh, what well, said, said, said that about 30 years ago, uh, they, they had turtle doves every day in the local area. Now they don't breed here at all. Just shows how important it is to almost encounter human, uh, well, counter human problems uh, and young people are crucial in that because conservation of things like turtle doves is the only way they're going to be safe from extinction or at least local extinction. For me, I've always been lucky in the sense of the opportunities I have, I have had since 2018 when I joined the National Trust. As I said earlier, 2019 was my big year and it was where I really got started with things such as visiting uh, huge, visiting places that really inspired me, meeting people that inspired me, all sorts of things like this. I've been lucky to visit Spurn, Browsey Island, Cornwall, all while doing conservation, environmental campaigning, things like that. And it's been, it's been one of those things that I wouldn't change for anything because the places I visited, you just find a new sense of natural world, the beauty in the natural world, and it's just something I have never stop loving. It's been really cool to meet people like Prince Charles last uh, December, I've met Steve Batchel and Chris Packham and all sorts of different people as well. And it's, these are opportunities that most 18 year olds would never dream of. And I will never stop appreciating the opportunities I have had because being involved with conservation has been something that's really sparked my interest more. And I know that even if I do intend to study geography, conservation would be something I'm always hoping to get involved with, whether that's locally or not. Will Greenwood, a uh, former English rugby player, said at an event in 2018 that, that I visited, uh, this memorable quote, that little things matter. If we all do the little things right, we can change the world for the better. I think it was almost better than any quote given by any naturalist or conservationist that day, because it once again emphasised the idea that even if you're not going to create a, a world changing movement, not doing it, not doing anything is definitely worse than doing something. And some of the small uh, projects that I've been part of, you've seen local change, for example, putting up nest boxes in a local uh, at Morton Hall Park while leading a biodiversity project, all sorts of things like that. The small changes really do matter. And I think that's something that emphasising to young people to get involved with is just very important, really. Um, more than this, I think it's, I once again, going back to the idea that everything should be fun and enjoyable. The community of people that I've met are some of the best out there. All of my best friends now really are from the nature community and I'd never have met them had I not got involved with everything that I did. So I probably wouldn't be here without them because honestly they've never they've never not had my back and I've said just yeah best friends I could probably ever ask for. Um, these are all experiences and, and friends everything about it that most young people won't get and it's equipped me for the working world pretty well. I'm hoping that once I get to uni I'll be able to find a job that I'll enjoy as well but I wouldn't have been able to get that without the opportunities that I have had. To finish off, I think it would be good to talk about how everyone can get involved because sometimes it can be difficult for young people to overcome the barrier of actually how do, how do I get involved? What opportunities are there out there for me? And what will other people think? Reaching out to, to people and social going through social media or through someone that you know is a naturalist isn't always a really good way to start because often they'll know people that know more than themselves and can get people involved. Things such as ringing, which is a great way for young people to really see a bird close, at, at close up and think, well, look at that and then be able to hold it or something and release it while directly knowing that what they're, do, what they're doing is uh, linked to science and conservation, because if that bird is refound a long, a long way away uh, or people can gather information about basically anything to do with it, where they're traveling, what weight they are, things like that is just a very good way to know that you're helping the science while also really enjoying yourself. BTO surveys are another brilliant way to get involved. I've been involved with web, web scouts, which are wetland bird survey counts, and essentially what they're great for is uh, helping you just count with common, common things locally. So 
whether that's just the birds, like a ducks in the local pond, you're at least outdoors and spending time in nature, which can be refreshing and interesting, even if it's not something that we're seeing amazing birds. But at the same time, looking locally to places such as nature, reserves, like the National Trust or the Wildlife Trust, they all have opportunities, but it's just looking out for those things that is really important. The last two things I'll cover quickly are Duke of Edinburgh, again, as I mentioned earlier. When I got involved when I was 13 or 14, I was just looking for somewhere to get, well, most people were looking for somewhere to, to volunteer, which was just a, oh, I better do an hour every week just so I can complete this. Where's the least, well, where's the least effort to go to, essentially? While I was kind of looking for somewhere that I would actually kind of enjoy because I knew that the conservation sector offered a lot of great opportunities for volunteering for Duke of Edinburgh or something like that. So reaching out to the National Trust was what I decided to do. And I know that there's many similar opportunities to that out there. Another thing is education. I often get asked about the natural history of GCSE and I'm hoping that someone will ask about it later as well because I've got a big opinion on that. Uh, but at the same time, education is just so important because if more people can find an interest in conservation, realize from a young age, the um, well, everything that comes around with it is just one of those things that I think will continue to spark uh, interest in young people and make them realize how cool it is and how great it is to get involved because some things like beauty of migration, damage from climate change and human activity, all of those are issues that are going to be faced every day now in the future and it's one of those things that if more people can realize how interesting it is and how important it is then hopefully the future of the environment will be much brighter. Thank you for listening and please feel free to ask any questions that was brilliant Arjun I'm kind of blown away by how much you've done already in your in your life like when I was uh when I was a teenager I was busy skateboarding and being moody but you've uh you know started saving the planet already so oh wow I'm still moody <laughs> pretty impressive <laughs> yeah. um do you want to um unshare your screen yeah. And then we'll hop into the questions. There's a few really good ones in there. Um, so let's kick off straight away. Let's have a look, see what people have asked. That's great. Right. So first question. This one's from Lisa. You mentioned a number of different organisations that you've worked with. Can you tell us a bit about your experience of working for them as a young person? So that's quite yeah. an expansive question. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot to talk about there, so that's great. Um, thank you for the question, Lisa, for a start. Uh, when I started the National Trust, it was the first time I'd got involved with an organisation, so I had no idea what to expect. But I was kind of blown away that within the first week, I'd met four people that were willing to help me and basically excellent role models. That meant that I was comfortable to go uh, to Brown Sea Island within a week, uh, which I was like, I don't think I'd ever have dreamt of. I was mostly going for the birds, I'll be honest, but at the same time, the conservation stuff I got into was what kept me going in that. So the National Trust is definitely something that hopefully going forward will continue to grow. They've been struggling a lot after uh, lockdowns and everything that's been going on. I listened to a podcast by Hillary McGrady recently summarising that. Uh, but I'm hoping that they'll continue to release more projects like Urban Rangers, which is the young ranger project I got involved with, uh, mm. because that will be very popular. And if there's that at almost all at National Trust sites, I know young people will be able to get involved there. The BTO uh, offer a huge range of opportunities every year for people interested in nature. So bird camp is one, uh, bird fair walks is another. There's all sorts of things there. What I really want to see are organisations like London Wildlife Trust who, can who have helped me a lot as well and do offer a lot of opportunities such as training ships, uh, things like that in London if they continue to grow I think especially in urban areas then they'll continue to offer opportunities most of my work's obviously been with the National Trust so I know the most about what they've done uh, but I just know that if you look online uh, well, the Wildlife Trust, the RSPB, BTO, um, who have I missed, Cameras Bog Trust obviously all sorts of people like that are really good to reach out to because they will have opportunities. Yeah yeah do you think they're all kind of accessible do you think it's easy for young people to find them and get involved with them I, I, I think it's a hard question to answer but I'd say that they could be more accessible uh, if you've got social media or know where someone it can be quite easy to get straight involved but at the same time 
there's not too much in schools so maybe if there are posters in schools for people to that, that they could almost say oh look at that poster i want to get involved that would make it a lot easier um at the moment it may be more for people who are already interested uh, rather than might want to get involved uh which is definitely i'd say a slight uh, barrier to accessibility uh, so yeah i guess in summary it's not the it's not unaccessible inaccessible but it, it is difficult at times to reach out uh, which is why there's almost like towards 14 15 when you get social media it becomes a lot easier yeah yeah you kind of need that communication tool to really sort of start seeing them hearing from them being able to communicate with them don't you so it's yeah, like kind exactly. of, if you wanted to yeah if you kind of wanted to get involved with a charity like that younger it would actually be probably quite tricky exactly yeah, yeah. I'd say yeah. so. um there's a good follow-up question here from gwen on a sort of similar topic so what would you say are the top three things conservation bodies could do to engage with young people what can they do to encourage more people like you to to go to them i mean i think one big thing would be working with schools between the age of seven and eleven i think that's when people almost have a natural interest in the in the natural world um people like being outdoors still quite young they to do more things um if conservation bodies so wildlife trusts and all sorts continue to go into schools and like such as bta youth representative scheme what we're doing is pushing people to go into schools and work with young people directly more of that would definitely help because it means that people will be able to get stuck in so working in a little garden or an allotment you're getting people to realize how much fun it is to be outdoors and i think as i said earlier is make sure it's fun so then conservation is attractive um another thing i'd say that is important are, are role models um if role models are able to produce more documentaries and things such as Devon 60 which i said was great for me more of them are really really good because i think if other young people if young people see more young people out there on tv or some of the opportunities you get from conservation how cool they are that's another thing that will definitely help um make it more accessible and attractive in general i think mm. a possible third thing uh could be again to do with education uh in the education spec uh when i was seven to eleven i barely learned anything i'd, I'd probably have one geography lesson a term or something like it was a bonus if we had anything like that but being able to do even simple things like i don't know puzzles or what have you things like that uh which are online resources again linked to what we're doing with bto things like that given to schools and young people i think uh, would very very much help uh them you know, uh, have something to do that would be interesting and hopefully make it seem interesting and cool yeah 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 i think uh i think i was probably a bit too old for deadly 60 having said that i did watch a few <laughs> i do enjoy them and i yeah. think that you've got a good point there like making it a little bit more fun or a bit yeah. different in certain places i think could really help exactly um, yeah 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 um ah oh, gwen's got another one here after you since you just answered that one and she's asking again now um she wants to know uh, your thoughts on the natural history GCSE. Yeah, so I mean, I've got a fairly strong opinion on that one, having been someone who didn't uh, have the option to do something like that. Uh, I found it quite frustrating myself that when I was learning things such as biology or geography, there's such a small uh, fraction of what we learn on conservation and biodiversity and ecosystems. I think what's been done to, to introduce it at GCSE age is a really good start because it means that people from the age of 14 to 16 now have the chance to learn about things uh, to, to do with nature but at the same time it's kind of tackling an audience of people that are already interested because anyone who doesn't really like it at that point will probably just not do it because it's optional um, if it was introduced as something involved with education towards the start of secondary school maybe age 11 or 12 uh, I think it would be better uh, maybe in addition uh, because then it might be able to spark an interest for more people uh, I probably directed to uh, an article by Bird Guides, which is a kind of bird reporting uh, app uh, group online. Um, they're really good, and they published an article last year and the year before on how people have a natural interest in wildlife until they're 11 or 12, and then they drift away. So if people were on almost main, their, their interests are kept until they're 13, 14, then more people might get to the natural GCSE in the first place. Yeah, that's a really good point. 
yeah you can't if it suddenly appears at gcse people aren't going to have any idea of what that might cover exactly, yeah. young people might be worrying about um other subjects that they might need for a levels and all that kind of thing so exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah that's a really good point yeah yeah um here's a more fun one what's your best ever find whilst birding and i'm oh. guessing they mean bird but they could also mean non-bird thing that you found whilst birding so let's have both let's have the bird and the non-bird thing i've, I've had a fair, fair amount of decent ish finds i've never found something completely mega uh but at the same time something i'd say at uh, my local site Bevington farmlands I, I, i'd say a recent bird which was a fire crest uh, because that was the first one seen there in 2017 not the rarest thing i've found which i can't like me remember uh but that was pretty uplifting especially as it was singing got a nice high-pitched song it was one of those things that i'd always been ready to find and finding one was very but it was great it's a great feeling and at the same time it's a nice bird so i got some nice pictures and recordings of that uh the second part i kind of think that's quite a difficult one to think of in, on the spot for I come across some seriously weird things uh whilst bird watching uh and i or I'm, I'm, I'm wondering maybe the most memorable thing then to twist it a bit is uh while going to see a rare bird in kent finding ourselves looking in a field inland while knowing that the beach behind us was a nudist beach which meant that everyone was focusing forwards because if you look back, you just felt awful with camera and scope and everything there. So everyone was definitely <laughs> focusing forwards. So that's, I'd say that's one of my most memorable moments, that's just to brilliant. twist it a little. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a bit of a classic there, I think. That is a classic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I once saw two Bonaparte's girls in one day, two different ones. I was pretty happy with that. Oh, that's good, yeah. That was a goodie. Uh, and just the other day, actually, I saw my first adder, which, by the way, is really cool. Like, if you don't think an adder is cool, then you're definitely wrong. Yeah. Um, I've never Adam, seen an adder. Awesome. Yeah. You've not yeah. seen one? Never seen one, no. I mean, memorable experience when it comes to looking for birds and then finding a grass snake was uh, being on Duke of Edinburgh a couple of years ago when an adder did cross the path and I didn't see it. But my entire group behind me was screaming because they were just like snake, snake, snake and running around <laughs> frantically, which is another good memory. But that means I've still not seen an adder. Yeah, yeah. Good time of year, um, sort of nowish, really. If you get up really early. Yeah, that's a big problem now. there. <laughs> um, here's a really good one. <clears throat> you mentioned the importance of role models in your talk. Who would be in your top three role models for young people interested in conservation right now? Uh, so Steve Baxter has always been my number one because of programs he's come up with. He's got a brilliant social media. He's delivered these um, sessions called One Wild Night, which did 2018, 2019, uh, December every year, which well for two years, and hopefully will be again in the future where uh, he had a series of talkers talk to an audience about their own experiences, which was very inspirational. I think the next one, slightly obvious one, which is David Attenborough, uh, because of everything he's done uh, and when it comes to conservation. Uh, and just, I think he's inspired a whole nation, if not the whole world, which not many people have done. Uh, while many of role models are kind of a, even on a national scale, he's been by far the most inspirational for everyone. And I think without him, the awareness of the changing natural world wouldn't be known as well. Uh, the next one is a, uh, is a, someone that i would uh just uh not many people do maybe maybe not as commonly known but uh lizzie daly uh who's uh, a presenter for bbc earth that i met last year and since then i've just i've actually really enjoyed watching her stuff uh on social media and i think she's very much and from a younger age means that she's able to use social media when it comes to vlogs and things and i've very much enjoyed all of her all of her blogs since then and i think meeting her was very inspirational itself because i felt a little bit I can't remember, I felt a little bit down that day for some reason. She very much picked me up and uh, in a sense uh, made me realise that I really need to get more confident with some things because I actually did have a platform that most other people didn't have. But at the same time, she's an amazing uh, role model for women as well. Uh, women in birding has been something very important recently. Uh, and I think the fact that she's been so such a voice for it has definitely helped as well. Yeah, fantastic. She's really underrated, I think. I think so too, she's yeah, great. massively underrated. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here's, here's, here's my um, spin on that question. 
who do you think will be the role models of the future? Like, who Ooh. do you see now in sort of your age range, maybe, or a bit younger or something, who you think could be the next big inspiration for people? Oh, that's a, that's a hard one. I think there's a lot of people out there that are, well, big role models. And I'm trying to think of names directly, but uh, I think, uh, obviously, Greta has been a massive change. I think Bella Lack and Dara McAnulty, the two people I met on uh, Country Girl Live a few years ago, um, mm. they made me feel a little bit like, am I meant to be with these two people here? Uh, because uh, <laughs> what, one of them's just written a book, the other's got, I don't know, thousands and thousands of followers on, on Twitter and is using a platform to create movies herself and I'm like yeah I don't think I, I can, be compared, can be compared on their level yet but I think those two are the one, uh, two ones to look out for but there's so many others out there and yeah. I think if you look online as well and actually look at some of the other talks being delivered you'll probably see how many people there are out there. Yeah yeah it's really inspiring to see how many young people are becoming big on social which is such an important platform now. But yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think you picked two brilliant ones. I'd, I'd actually probably go and say that they already are role models. Oh, think, yeah. I'm and they sure. inspire me. Like, Dar- Dara's award winning book is incredible. Like, yeah. absolutely incredible. Yeah. And Bella's, like, authoritative voice is just, yeah, just really, yeah. really inspiring. Okay. Um, right. A couple more questions here. So Stone Chat 42, great name for a bird talk. Do you have any new projects coming up that you're excited about? That, that's a hard one. Um, I, I'd say at the moment, I'm just looking forward to continuing to work with BTO and everything we're doing there. Uh, but I've definitely got some interesting news coming up when it comes to sound recording. And I think that's definitely something I'm hoping to continue to get into because I think that's a great way into getting young people involved and in a slightly different, in, in a bit of a spin uh, because the equipment you can use for sound recording, which I've got, uh, which is a sound recorder and a microphone, costs less than 100 quid. The options can be really expensive. So almost showing that there's ways into nature which can be uh, help people from all sorts of backgrounds. I think that's kind of where I'm hoping to shift towards, but I haven't got any big projects as such. And I think that's mostly from A-levels. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, pretty busy with A-levels, but that sounds like a great um, idea for a project. Like- yeah supporting people who might not be able to do it or afford it themselves to then get into birding in some way i think that's exactly, yeah, yeah. just like brilliant actually brilliant idea um here's another question uh oh this is a good one what thing conservation related do you wish you had got involved with earlier oh that's uh that's definitely a tough one i think it would probably be volunteering because um while it was 12 when i kind of Heard of, but I went to Malaysia and everything there was still a two-year gap where I um, didn't do too much just really uh, and I think when I got Twitter in, when I was 15 it means that all the big opportunities I've got now when I'm 17 or 18 while a few other people uh, younger than me started when they were 12 or 13 with support parents there which means that when they were 15 they were getting your similar opportunities to the ones I'm getting uh, and I just think if I'd had that voice for a few extra years I could have helps maybe help lead more projects or something like that uh, which just means that going going forward i think i recommend people from like 12 to 13 year olds really get involved yeah yeah i think it's really easy to actually this this came up in the talk um yesterday it's really easy to see other people kind of doing well and then maybe feel like you could be doing more and then that kind exactly. of puts a lot of pressure on you but I think, you know, you start these things when you start them and you mm-hmm. do what you do. And that's sort of maybe how it was meant to be. You exactly. Yeah. Think, and you're doing loads already. So. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think I'm quite I'm very happy with everything that I've got at the moment. And it's definitely something I wouldn't really change for anything. I would I probably wouldn't want more either because at the moment I'm managing a amount and actually able to put a lot of effort into the things I have got. Uh, so I think if I've been at some younger age, I feel like there might have been a higher expectation. Uh, so I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with where it is at the moment yeah yeah um here's uh, oh here's a, a quick question about urban rangers so florence is wondering if they've stopped doing the urban rangers i think that's in relation to um national trust uh they definitely haven't for my group uh which has been online ever since uh, lockdown started again uh, and this sunday is the first back to real life session so that's very exciting um i don't know about the other ones across the country i think there are six others um 
but I did hear that I'm, I, the National Trust are hoping to push it more and have more set up in the near future, which is really good news uh, altogether. Although they've definitely struggled, I'm, I'm definitely, I definitely think that they're one of the best organisations for getting people involved with national heritage and the environment. So I think my one's definitely continuing. So I'm very happy about that. Nice. Um, and urban wildlife, I mean, that's a super important thing to be looking more into because it's so it's so much more apparent and accessible to the people who live exactly, there. Exactly, yeah. I think urban parks, people probably didn't realise as much during as before lockdown, but once people uh, realised that they had a lot more time on their hands and actually wanted to go outdoors more often because it was your kind of daily exercise, people were like actually exploring their local area more. And that's where people were actually appreciating London wild, wildlife in London, especially, or in urban areas. And a number of conversations I had at the start of last lockdown, and people just saying, oh, I really got to watch the bees and the butterflies the other day. That was really nice. And I, people are often surprised about what they can see, which I think is really good as well. Yeah, yeah. Right, and there's one last question. And uh, we may have had a little chat about this possibly coming up earlier, <laughs> but I'm going to ask, uh, ask it to you anyway. What is the bird that you feel you should have seen but has so far eluded you? I think this is the, uh, I don't know, maybe fifth or sixth talk I've probably had to talk about this. So thanks for that. I, I think I probably know who asked it. But um, <laughs> it, it, the, yeah, the bird that I've not seen is Kitty Wake. It's a you know fairly dull bird to me now at this point. I've given up seeing them. I, I think I'll find one eventually. It would be a massive relief, if anything. The, all, all the bullying and you know everything that I've experienced because of it, it's horrible. No, it's not really. But I think it's a good laugh that everyone can joke about it. And I, yeah, that's the one bird I've never seen before. There's always one. There's always There's one. Always Bogey one. bird. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> cool. That's um, that's all the questions. And we're basically bang on the hour. So I'm going to wind it up there. So thank you so much to everyone who's watched. Um, thanks for all the fantastic questions. And of course, thank you to Arjun. Um, and so, yeah, that's the end of the live stream. Thanks so much for coming. We've got a whole um, series of uh, live talks coming up. So check out the program. I'll leave a link in the chat and hopefully we'll see you at some of those soon. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.